Hey everyone, thanks for joining today. Uh, this is Mike Kane here with Elephant Scale. And uh, hopefully this is your, uh, uh, this isn't your first class with us here. If it is, uh, this should be a fun one for you anyways. Uh, today, we're gonna continue our series on machine learning engineering. And we are going to talk about TensorFlow callbacks and all the cool things we can do with them to optimize our training. So. Uh, without further ado, um, we'll jump right into it. Before we do here, uh, I do want to make sure that everybody knows who we are and what we're doing here. Okay, so Elephant Scale is a world-class training company here, um, and uh, they, we specialize in all kinds of things from DevOps and big data, Spark, uh, anything you could ever need there, uh, to AI and machine learning. So uh, our goal here is to put more information out there. Uh, we saw a need in the market um, for trainings that were based on doing on what engineers and people need uh, there's a pl there's plenty of great trainings out there uh, about the theory behind deep learning or you know the math behind it here uh, but we saw uh, that there's not a lot out there for people that said well yeah but how do I actually use it uh, so that's our specialty and we wanted to make sure that you all uh, can see some of this stuff here and if you're interested in working with us here we'd love to talk to you feel free to shoot us an email or send us a message in the chat so uh, without further ado, let's jump right into it. So let me share my screen here. Let's see, where am I? What screen? Okay, we're gonna go to screen one. And uh, again, I will be, um, uh, I have questions, uh, the, the question and answer section open here and the chat window open as well. Uh, so if you have any questions throughout today's training, uh, go ahead and just let me know. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll sh be sure to answer them. Um, so, whoops, you can access this in the doc um, that is in the Google Drive folder um, that we've all been working here. Suji, would you mind dropping a link to that um, in the Google Drive folder in the chat window, if you can, please? Um, and in the meantime here, um, let's talk a bit about where we've been so far. So, um, in our first class, uh, we got to see a bit about um, how just everything that TensorFlow can do, right? We got a feel for uh, what it is and what we can do with it here. Uh, we got a feel for uh, uh, how to build a model, why we should use TensorFlow, maybe what the other libraries are out there. And um, in the following one, we learned about how to train some bigger models um, that were a bit more heavy duty and how to speed up that training using um, uh, GPUs and TPUs. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun with that. Um, and uh, today, now that we know how to train neural networks, we know a bit about the theory, we know how to use the libraries, the tools. Um, oh, whoops, it is session three. Sorry about that. I've got the wrong class in here. Thank you so much. Um, and you'll want to take a look at, uh, again, in the chat window here, you'll see the session notes. Uh, and let me just add that link uh, right to the top of that here um, so that you guys can see that while I'm talking. All right. Oops. So uh, you can go to that tiny URL link here, and that will bring you to... Um, the folder where you'll find, uh, excuse me, the document here has all the good thing you could ever care about here, the Zoom link, um, a survey. We'd love to know a bit more about you so we can customize these trainings uh, for what you're looking for here. And then a bit more about um, what we're doing here, the presenters. Uh, and you'll find our notes here, okay? So um, inside of all this, you'll find uh, recordings of previous trainings. If you didn't get a chance to watch those, uh, the class notes from them as well, uh, the notebooks, all this is very interactive here, okay? Uh, inside the Google Drive folder that links to, you'll also find a copy of this uh, Jupyter, uh, this Google Colab notebook here, so you can run things live if you want to code along with us. So um, we've learned about deep learning, we've learned about TensorFlow here, we've built some trained some models, and we've seen just how long they can take. We've also learned that this is a very iterative process. We cannot uh, just expect that, you know, oh, well, I can just 
you know, crunch these numbers or run this code or this equation, and I'll know exactly what architecture I should use. I'll know exactly what hyperparameters I should use. Uh, we only get there through experimentation. Um, that this is one of the reasons why deep learning is so hard. And this is one of the reasons why uh, machine learning engineers are paid so well, uh, is because it is very hard and you have to understand a lot of moving parts. So that being said, that means our time is valuable and we wanna waste as little of it as possible watching the bar move forward as we train, right? So today we're gonna learn about how we can add some programmatic behavior to our model training, uh, like our training loops by using TensorFlow callbacks. We'll learn how to save a model, We'll learn how to make use of some cutting edge techniques like early stopping um, so that we don't train any longer than we need to, which saves us not only time, but generally you're training in the cloud. So a lot of money too, okay? Um, we will be uh, training, uh, we'll look at how we can do things like hyperparameter tuning uh, for what is perhaps the most important hyperparameter out there, the learning rate. Um, and in that, we'll see how we can set up our own learning rate scheduler uh, or we can just uh, use it to, to make intelligent decisions for us and say, hey, actually, I want you to only reduce this learning rate when our learning has plateaued. Um, and it can be very intelligent about that. We'll learn all about TensorBoard and play with that, which is a lot of fun to get some very nice, heavy duty visualizations of our models metrics and how we can use this to really start investigating how our model's doing. And then finally, we'll learn how we can write our own custom callbacks and then, the world is your oyster, because um, you can add any sort of programmatic behavior, any code you want, as long as you put it in a callback class and you pass it in as you're seeing today, you can do some in interesting stuff. So we've got uh, not one, but two demos of that. One is just a simple one that prints out some stuff just to show that you know inside of, at the end of the epoch, you can do this. And then the other is uh, a way to, it's an example of how to send yourself a text message with statistics about training or to tell you that training is done using a third party API like Twilio. Um, so we will see that um, and there's a lot of instructions and sample code there. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to make sure that my uh, factory, uh, excuse me, my runtime type is set to GPU and it is. So we should be good there, okay? Um, so I'm gonna start by running this cell, okay? And um, whereas in the previous uh, lessons here, we focused on what the data set was, what the model was, the, the training pipelines, all that good stuff. Um, we're not gonna do that today. If you're uh, looking at this code and you're saying, wait, I don't understand what a neural network is or how this code works here, uh, that's okay. We can definitely help you through that. Uh, I would encourage you to stop uh, watching this and go watch our recorded videos from our two previous sessions. And those will walk you through the ins and outs of what a neural network is and how we're building them in TensorFlow, how we're building out our training pipeline, things like that. So we're gonna skate right by that today, okay? Um, the data set we'll be working with is the Fashion MNIST data set, which is from the Zalando research group there. Um, and they took a bunch of pixel, uh, like uh, kind of pixelized images here that are 28 by 28 by one. So grayscale images, just like MNIST, but MNIST is easy. It's too easy in some ways here. This is a bit harder. As you can see, there's a big, uh, you know, big difference between some of these things here, and there's a little difference between others. So uh, that t-shirt or top and that dress, for instance, might be a bit challenging for the model to tell the difference between here. So we really want to see, is this model really learning generalizable features? So we're going to work with that. And if you've been in our previous ones uh, here, then you probably will recognize uh, some of this code here as we're gonna normalize the images, we're gonna run our training pipeline, we're gonna run our testing pipeline, everything's set. Now, one difference here we have is that I have actually um, taken all the code to create a single model and dropped it in a function called create model. And you can see I have hyperparameters and the model architecture already set. I even compile the model and then I return it, okay? And the reason for that is uh, we're not really worried about the model this time. We're worried about adding callbacks to the model and, and uh, we want that to be uh, center stage here. So uh, for this lesson, we're not gonna be tweaking things like, you know, let's add more filters, let's add a different filter size or more neurons. We're gonna stay static here, okay? So I'm gonna run this and that's gonna set me up there. 
Okay, so um, this first section here just explains what a callback is. Okay, so a callback is a piece of code uh, in TensorFlow uh, that allows uh, the model itself to trigger certain behaviors when uh, certain specified times have happened, right? So you can do this um, where, for instance, maybe you want uh, the model to do something every time an epoch ends, or maybe every time an epoch begins. Maybe you want to do it every time it grabs a new mini batch, right? Another group of, uh, right now we're batching it 128 examples per. So it could be that, right? You might say, hey, actually, I want to do this. Every time a new batch begins, do this, right? Or do that. Um, this is great for logging. This is great for um, a lot of different things that we can do here. And it allows you not just to get logs and information, but to act on them. Um, so this is all based on a custom class, or excuse me, a, 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 a class that comes with TensorFlow inside of Keras. So Keras is what kind of started uh, us down this rabbit hole. And the TensorFlow community has just, you know, again, as we said, TensorFlow 2 is Kerasized. So everything is following the simplicity and elegance of Keras. So that means we don't have to import Keras or any of that stuff. We can just grab the callbacks we need, uh, train our models, and pass them in uh, when we're ready to train. So the first thing we're going to do is a model checkpoint, okay? And this model checkpoint uh, is pretty awesome in that, um, you know, it's generally a common question to say, okay, I've trained my model, what do I do now? Uh, well, the first thing we need to do is save our model, right? Now, there's a number of reasons we might want to save our model. Obviously, the, the most common one here um, uh, is the, the most common um, thing we can do here is to just say, hey, I'm done. I need to load it over here, like in this Docker container, so we can productionize it, right? Uh, it might also be a bit different where you might say like, hey, um, I want my model, uh, you know, this is going to run really long and sometimes these things time out or, you know, I've been spending all this time and money on training this here and, you know, what if the power goes out? So you generally want to save your work, right? You want to save the weights that these models are learning. So the way that works out uh, is we can use the model checkpoint callback. Now, the cool thing about model checkpoints is it's not dumb. It doesn't just overwrite each time because as we saw before, um, training is not monotonic. It's not like the model gets better every epoch. We hope it does, but at some point it's going to get noisy. It might do worse on epoch four than epoch three. Uh, it might peak at epoch six. And then if we train for 30 more epochs, it just does worse and worse because it's overfitting the data and kind of messing up. Right, so um, what model checkpoints will do for us is allow us to not just save a checkpoint of what the weights were at that end of that given epoch, but to save the best version, right? So we can say, hey, only update, only overwrite if the one you're overwriting is better than what currently exists. Uh, and we can tell it by how much do we care about, what metric are we monitoring here? For instance, you can say, I care about accuracy or I care about loss or I care about validation accuracy or validation loss. So all we have to do to start is we have to tell it where it's going to go, uh, what file path. Okay. Uh, I do see some questions in chat here that say, um, where's the notebook or the GitHub link here? So if we go up to uh, this, whoops, let me kind of scroll up here. Let me show you guys real quick. So if we click on this, and this brings us to this document, we are going to follow this to, it's either in the Git repo or the class folder, right? So if I go to the class folder and I go to the Google Drive, all right, and we see um, it's under callbacks right here, 04 callbacks here, right? So again, it was, I just followed uh, the link and I went to the class folder. Class folder brought me to here. We have these here, right? And now we're in callbacks here, okay? Uh, and uh, I don't believe there's actually anything in this one. Oh yeah, that's where we started here. So uh, apologies, this should be over here, but I'll leave it for now just for simplicity's sake. We'll clean it all up after. So go ahead and go to 04 callbacks and it's in here, okay? 
Um, and again, if you're looking for a Git repo because you want to run this locally, then all you need to do is go to right here, Git repo with code, and this will bring you to the Elephant Scale GitHub page. And we're on this one here in class four notebook. I don't know why I thought this was four. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's how you can do that and, and follow along if you want. I would encourage you to run this in a collab notebook. Make sure that when you open it up, you make a copy. Um, so you can just open in playground mode once you open that because these things work like Google Docs. And uh, what you don't want to do is have everybody else typing and messing up your code and vice versa here. So you can save a copy in your own drive or open in playground mode and that'll make it so you have your own personal version of this running in Colab. Uh, I do recommend running it in Colab as opposed to locally, at least for right now, because the model I built is fairly big. Um, it will take it about two minutes per epoch and we're gonna do a lot of training uh, this time here. So um, if you do it with a GPU, it's, you know, about, I don't know, between five and, ten, five and 10 seconds. So it'll make it a lot faster for you, a lot simpler, okay? Um, so great questions. Thank you for asking those. Glad we got that worked out. So we're back down here with our callbacks. We run these cells. Now, first thing we need to do um, is to make, uh, we have to know where we're going to put it. Now, you can always just pass in like where we are, which is, you know, just a dot slash. Um, and that will drop the a, a file, a dot pb file. Uh, and then two folders that contain things that are useful as well. I think it's assets and variables. Um, so you can do that, but generally you're probably not going to want to muck up wherever your notebook is. So I encourage you make a folder somewhere, get the path to that folder, uh, relative or absolute, um, set it somewhere, and then you just pass it in, right? And then we need to tell it what we want to monitor. So we're saying, hey, I want you to grab, um, save uh, every time the uh, we get better val loss, right? And we want our loss to go down. A loss is our measure of total error, total combined error, right? According to whatever loss function we're using. Um, in this case, we're using sparse categorical cross entropy. So uh, we're gonna say that we want the loss to go down each time. So we're basically saying, hey, only save, only overwrite whatever's in that, that saved model folder, only overwrite it if uh, the loss is lower than it was before, right? Now there's other things that you can do here. You can set this and let's look at the documentation from this here. I think Keras has wonderful documentation on all this here. So it basically says, uh, you know, here's the model checkpoint. Here's some of the things and how and when you should use them. For instance, if you only wanted to save the weights, you could. Uh, although if you don't know what that means or how, why you would use that, don't uh, just, just save it all. Uh, it's much easier to load up. Um, you can tell it when or how often you can tell it only save the best or save copies from every single epoch. You can do that too. If you want to see, for instance, well, what if I want to do curriculum training or have the model diverge or something like that? That's absolutely an option. So I'm going to go ahead and create this folder. Okay. That is created. Um, now this is the common workflow that you're going to see uh, again and again throughout today's training. We have to create the callback. And then all we do is we wrap that callback in a Python list and pass that list into the callbacks parameter when we call our model.fit. So I'm gonna call that, and I'm gonna call uh, this one to run it here. Oh, whoops, excuse me, I need to create the model. So I'm gonna say model equals create model, and we run it. Oh, I'm sorry, we're gonna set epochs to 10. There we are. And it's gonna take, uh, you know, between five and 15 seconds per epoch here. And what we're looking for is when it tells us it's go, it saved it. So we'll see the actual readout here changes because we passed in this callback whenever it checkpoints it. And here is exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, it's gonna basically say um, right here. So assets written, right, we're here, and it's just saying like assets written to save model dot that here. What that's basically telling us is, hey, this, this one was better than the last one, we're overwriting it, we're overwriting it, we're overwriting it. And eventually here we'll see an epoch where it is not better and we will not see that message, uh, which is exactly the type of behavior we want. So uh, for 10, it may just continue increasing. We haven't started overfitting yet, but we'll see. So 
So our model's finishing up here. Yep, continued along, so not too bad. And it looks like our validation loss did decrease kind of monotonically every time it was, you know, each new one was lower than the last. Now, we can do an LS call on save model and see what's in there. And that was an empty folder. Now we see assets, our save model.pb file and a variables folder. So uh, it was saved very easily. Now, um, we're not going to go into how to load a model from a checkpoint. However, it's dead simple. It's one line of code. You can get it from the TensorFlow callback. You can just Google like TensorFlow load model from checkpoint. Very, very easy to do. Okay, um, so um, that's the first callback we're going to work with here. And this one is probably the most useful and least exciting because, again, we need to save our work. Um, but how we're saving our work, you know, there, there's cooler things we can do here. So early stopping is one of these cool things, right? Um, the challenge with early stopping, uh, is, or the challenge with deep learning and why we need early stopping is that I'm going to see that model get uh, better and better and better, and then eventually it's going to plateau, right? Our model's going to converge, which is what we want to happen. However, uh, if my model, I, right now, the, I've got it set to train for 50 epochs. Um, but what if my model stops really getting better after 10 epochs? Do I really want it to train for 40 more? Well, I don't want to waste my time. And more importantly, I don't want to waste my money because running it on GPUs is expensive. Um, so what do we do? Well, um, it would be great if I could sit there and monitor and say, wait, this one wasn't good enough. Duh. Okay, there's been three or four in a row where it's not getting better. I think it's done learning and I could just stop it. Um, and that's what exactly what the early stopping callback allows us to do. So we can pass this in and we can say, okay, um, I'm going to tell it what metric to watch, which is validation accuracy. Um, I've set the, and uh, the min delta is saying, well, you're going to see some changes here, right? So uh, what if the model is getting better each time, but it's getting 0 0.0001 better each time? Well, is that enough? Or is, is that like functionally no different to you? And you say, no, nah, cut it. So this is where we can set it, right? So, uh, and patience is how many epochs do I need to see it not get past the minimum delta? before stopping. So if I set min delta to zero and patience to one, then the first epoch where it didn't improve, it would stop. Now, as we said, neural networks are noisy. They're all over the place when they're training. You'll see it go up and down. There's, you know, we call that thrashing. So we don't necessarily want to just jump the gun and say, stop learning, cancel the training. Uh, the first time we hit an epoch, where the model didn't do better, right? So what we can say is generally we're gonna say, I'm gonna set a patience, I might set a patience of like five epochs or something like that. Um, a min delta of you know, a low number or zero is fine, uh, realistically. If, you know, generally what I find is the longer the, um, the patience, the, the more comfortable I am with setting a low uh, this year. Uh, good question from the audience here. Uh, could one use one metric to monitor to train and then there's no improvement, switch to the other metric. Um, and then another to create a model that is good across one or more monitored metrics. Um, it's a good question. I see where you're coming from. Um, so it's important to realize that when we're talking about this here, um, it, you, you can't change one metric without changing the other, right? So um, there's really, the, the reason isn't because I wanna train a model that's really good at, at loss and a model that's really good at accuracy, they're actually measuring the same things. They're it's like if I gave you back, um, so loss is just like, let's pretend I'm a teacher and I'm grading your papers. Um, I can, it, when I write 98%, right? You scored a 98, um, that's a measure of accuracy, right? That's a measure of how many did you get correct, right? Loss would be if I wrote three out of five wrong, Right, so it's just a measure of uh, what is the total amount of error that you had. Now, in both cases, you had the same score on the test, right? Um, so, well, 
let's assume three out of five somehow get you on 98. <laughs> I'm making numbers up out of the air here. But essentially, it, it's uh, about just how we're reporting how the model did. So uh, in this case, there is no difference for these metrics here. Um, typically, loss is a better measure of learning because uh, loss is showing us that the model is getting these things less wrong. Uh, that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's going to get, you know, an extra one right, right? So when a model is 80% sure it's looking at a pair of shoes and it gets, and it is a pair of shoes, that model is 80% correct, but it's also 20% incorrect, right? A perfect answer would be, I'm 100% sure that's a pair of shoes. Um, so the next time around, um, if the model says, I'm 85% sure this is a pair of shoes, uh, then our overall loss will have gone, gone down. The model is getting better, but the accuracy will not have gone up because it got that one right last time, right? It still got full credit for being like, yeah, I saw shoes and I said shoes. Um, but the loss is what it's using to say, oh, well, how could I get better, right? Well, you already won the game. This is how you run the score up, essentially. So excellent question. Thanks for asking it here. Um, so we're going to keep moving. And so if I run this early stopping checkpoint, let's see what it looks like. I highly doubt we'll get to all um, through all 50 epochs. Let's see here. Uh, I'm betting it'll cut out at about five or six, if that, um, where I'm basically telling it, give me two epochs in a row where the model did not improve by greater than half a point. And we're done, right? And as we see here, um, the model, if we go from, uh, from here to here, like, so the delta between uh, 0 0.9179 and 0 0.9186, obviously, that is not uh, 0.5, right? That's less than 0.5. And the jump from here to here is less than 0.5. So again, um, I would set a much lower number. This is obviously this model is still learning, right? We can tell that by our losses going down too and our accuracy is going up. So I want to be clear in the real world here, I would absolutely let this guy stop training. I would set a minimum delta of about maybe zero. Um, I would monitor probably val, uh, val loss instead of val accuracy, because uh, that could be a better measure of learning uh, than accuracy. Um, and I would set a patience of, I don't know, five or something like that. Um, but again, these are things you have to try, right? So it couldn't be it's popping out a local minima and it got stuck and then it kind of has a breakthrough and moves on. Um, so um, that is early stopping, and this is going to save y'all an insane amount of time. Uh, this is really, really helpful here, okay? Uh, and the model just kind of ends there. Now, um, you'll notice I passed in two callbacks here. I passed in early stopping callback and checkpoint callback. This is the very reason that when we instantiate these callbacks uh, individually, we don't pass them individually. We wrap them in a list because... Maybe I want to, uh, to do this and say like, hey, I stop early, but also keep track of your best weights, keep track of your best performance. That's what I want saved. Um, let's go. And, and again, uh, I do want to, uh, one, one sticking point that people sometimes have here is they say, well, what's the difference? It, it, let's say my model saved at epoch two, and then I had a patience of like four and it cut off at epoch six right? Um, then it is not, uh, um, although the best weights epoch two will be what's in that saved models folder we created, um, the model itself is still in memory. And it is not, those weights are not equal to what it was in the saved models folder because we kept training, right? We trained for four more epochs. So those weights are in memory and they are getting updated. Um, and so, Maybe if you say, oh, okay, I want the best version here, you have to remember, go back and say, go back and reload from that saved place here, right? Or, you know, functionally you go, well, ah, there's not that, that much of a difference, we'll keep going with this. Because uh, maybe you're gonna do some other stuff. Like for instance, um, there's some types of deep learning techniques where you use multiple models together, um, like adversarial training. Um, some of you all might've heard of like uh, generative adversarial networks where you train a model, um, you train two models at the same time and uh, they're training against each other. So one score goes up when it tricks the other. Um, and that's how you see like, you know, this face does not exist, this person does not exist.com or something like that. 
um, those are all generated with GANs. So in that case here, you would want to be very careful and think about like, well, I've got more code to write. Do I keep working with this, you know, variable that's stored in the, uh, the model that's stored in the variable model in memory, or do I dump this and load back my saved version here? So just something to be aware of because there can be a difference. Uh, and I know that definitely burned me a couple times uh, when I was learning all this stuff here. So this brings us to our learning rate, okay? Um, so the learning rate is widely considered by many people to be the most important hyperparameter you can have. Uh, in deep learning. Models that do poorly aren't necessarily bad models. It could be that you have a value for your learning rate, which is not that good. Maybe it's too large, right? So um, if this is your first exposure to learning rate, we're not going to go too deeply into what it is, but a learning rate is essentially a multiplier meant to shrink, right? It's meant to shrink how much we um, uh, it's meant to kind of shrink how much we adjust the weights uh, after each batch, so each step, right? So how far, you know, we know that weights go up or down um, based on um, the, what the error backprop is coming through. And how much they go up or down is based on how much that error was. So if it had a really bad epoch, it's going to move some of these things a lot, depending on, you know, part of the, um, you know, it's just... Um, a lot of differential calculus going on there here, right? So all these partial derivatives. Um, so some of them are gonna be quite high, some of them are gonna be quite low. So it's quite possible to shoot past that local minima, right? Um, so let's say, I want you to picture this, right? Think of, if you're a skateboarder, think of a half pipe. And if I had to move 10 feet forward, let's say I have a 20 foot half pipe, right? It's 20 feet from the side of the half pipe I'm standing at the top of now to the other side. Right. If I was going to lay a plank and walk across the half pipe and not go down into the curve, if I wanted to walk across, I'd need a 20 foot plank to do that. Right. Well, I want to get to the lowest point. That's the bottom of the half pipe. If I rolled a ball, it would go up and down and up and down and eventually it would stop rolling somewhere in the center. So the problem is when we're adjusting these weights, we can't see the half pipe. We can't see if, the, if going this direction makes us go up or down more with overall loss, because really well, our loss is, is, you know, each different parameter has its own half pipe. It has its own local minimum we're trying to get to. So um, sometimes we need to take big steps, right? But sometimes we need to take small steps. So if I want to get exactly to um, the middle of that half pipe, right? And that's 10 steps away. If I'm taking a step size of three, well, then what happens? If, the, if every step I take, every, walk, or every move I make is three steps. Well, the first time I get it wrong, I move forward three steps, right? And I go down, great. I keep, I go, I get it wrong again, I move forward three more steps. Uh, I'm now four steps from the minima, right? I'm on four steps from there. I move one more uh, and I'm now one step from the minima. I keep moving in the same direction, but I have to take three steps. So now what happens? I shoot right past the bottom of the half pipe past my target, and I'm now two steps on the other side, right? So now what happens? Well, I know I need to move the other direction, but I'm one step, uh, you know, so I'm two steps past it. I go three steps backwards. That puts me one step before it. I go three steps forward, and I'm just going to bounce back and forth from positive two to negative one, positive two, negative one, positive two, negative one. So I need to shrink the steps I took. Right, I need to say, instead of taking three steps every time here, what if I take two or one or half a step, right? Now, it will take me more steps to get to there with a smaller learning rate. However, I'm much less likely to overshoot and I'm much more likely to end very, very, very close to the center of that, uh, right? Okay, so that's one way we can think about what a learning rate is. It's a way of shrinking our steps because you can, uh, this is something I encourage you to set if you're unsure or unfamiliar here, uh, we'll post some great links um, from uh, guys like Chris Ola, who are kind of legends in the field of deep learning, uh, who write some excellent uh, interactive tutorials to help you understand what a learning rate is uh, and how changing it will affect your model and your performance and things like that here. And you'll see it kind of goes all over the place, okay? Um, but uh, we want to make sure that um, 
that you know whatever that schedule is here, we can change it because again, uh, it's very common to set a learning rate, just the LR equals value uh, when you're creating your model. Um, but what I need it to be at epoch one and what I need it to be at epoch 50 are probably very different learning rates. In the beginning, I likely wanna take big steps. And then as I get uh, closer and closer and closer to my minimum, I probably wanna take smaller and smaller and smaller steps. That way, I get the best of both worlds. I cover the distance more quickly, but I get closer to my overall target. Okay, um, so there are a lot of schemes out there for, uh, for this year. Oh, I see a question come through here. Someone says, just wondering, could the fact that the model is not improving after X epochs simply mean that it has reached some local maximum or minimum? But if we push it out of that state, we can find a better local max or min uh, with more learning and can find a better model. Uh, yes, that is an excellent question. You are absolutely correct. That is always a possibility. Um, however, uh, the hard part is knowing when you are at that local minimum and if there's a better one. Because again, we have no view of the global space, right? Um, when we learn deep learning and we're looking at these kind of topological graphs that look like a map of mountains and peaks and valleys here, and that's basically saying, well, if I set X and Y and Z to these values, you know, how high I, or if I set X and Y, my Z value is how high or low my loss is. I want to get to the lowest point in that graph. The problem there is, is when we're actually training, we don't know, the model doesn't know, nobody knows um, if the point I'm at now is at the lowest point, right? So there are some techniques out there um, in terms of optimizers that will help you kind of pop out of these local minima, right? Uh, so something like uh, momentum, a very common uh, thing to use is something like Nesterov momentum. Uh, and that is definitely an option. However, um, uh, it's very important to understand, generally the models you're using, the optimizers you're using, excuse me, not models, the optimizer you're using, um, the ones that are most popular right now, things like Atom, which is adaptive moment estimation, or uh, RMS prop, um, or Nesterov momentum, uh, all these things here, eta grad, eta delta, all these optimizers typically have things that are built in. Um, to deal with this sort of thing. So they're naturally going to help you pop out of these things here. Will they take more time? Sometimes they will. Uh, however, uh, this is why we're going to set that patience value. So um, there are times, depending on the model, depending, I mean, I, I, it's hard to generalize here, but there are some tasks where, you know, if you're training a model, it might take a week. Um, you know, if you're working on like Facebook AI research or Google's team or something, and you're training a really large generative model or something like that, then it's quite possible you're gonna train that model for like a week at a time. Um, and it might get caught in local minima where it takes it hours or even a day to pop out of sometimes. Although typically the longer it's stuck there, the you know, with each passing epoch where it doesn't pop out of there, you can generally start to realize, okay, it, it's stuck. It's not going any further here. Um, so yes, uh, that is an excellent question and absolutely uh, you can do that here. So. That's typically why you have a learning rate scheduler, because if you're stuck in that local minima, well, one thing that'll generally help you pop out of these local, uh, local minima sometimes here uh, is reducing that learning rate, okay, where it'll help it go. So, because uh, it's generally more often here that uh, local minima aren't local minima, they're actually something called a saddle point. So think of a, uh, uh, like a, a saddle you'd put on the back of a horse, right? Um, that is different from a bowl, right? A bowl would be a convex space. Any way you head, it's always moving towards the center, right? If you just set a ball in there, it's gonna roll. Now, it, where you put a ball on a horse's saddle, which is, you know, if I'm standing at the back uh, of the horse here and I'm looking at the saddle, I'm gonna see it start high, go low, and then go high again, like a half pipe. But if I'm standing in the center, that's not actually the lowest point, right? Um, if I go left or right from that, I fall off the side of the saddle, I go even further lower, right? So it turns out that it's very rare. There's been some good research um, that is very, very, you know, a lot of deep math there um, that kind of showed that most local minima aren't actually local minima. A local minima would mean like, hey, it, it, no matter which way you go, you're stuck here, right? It's a hole you're stuck in. Um, it's actually a saddle point where in some directions, the directions that were giving you the most signal at that time, uh, then yes, you can't go, you know, 
changing the parameter for x1 is not going to up or down. It's not going to make any difference here, right? In that direction, it's a local minima. However, in others, it's not, right? So going forward and backwards in terms of the, my horse's saddle example, you're stuck, right? Going back and forth, there's nothing you can do to increase that. However, you go left or right and the model is going to go, oh, wait, I found a new direction to go and it will pick up signal and start tweaking those parameters here. Okay, excellent intuition, excellent question. Um, thank you for asking it. So this is why we would use a learning rate scheduler. So how does the learning rate scheduler work? Well, the learning rate scheduler works by uh, you pass in a function and that function uh, has to do two things. It has to take in the epoch and the value of the learning rate and it has to return whatever that updated learning rate is here. So I wrote the simplest one I can think of here where we're just gonna take in the learning rate and we're gonna reduce it by 0 0.0001, right? So I'm gonna run this to create the function. Then I pass in this function, reduce LR to my learning rate scheduler callback. And again, all these callbacks are inside of Keras, which is inside of TensorFlow. So if I wanna get callbacks, I go to tf.keras.callbacks dot whatever pre-built one I want. Okay, so I run this, that creates it. Um, and when I train this model here, you're gonna see it, it outputs what the updated learning rate is after each one. Now with the LR here at the end. Now you'll notice that there is not a huge difference. Well, okay, well we do see a change in a bit here uh, on the sides here. Um, So, and for anybody that's just joining us late here, um, just to point out, if you go to uh, inside the chat window, there is a, um, in the Zoom webinar chat, there's a tiny URL link. It's also it's this one right here, tinyurl.com slash RFGBCGT. Um, and that will bring you to this doc. This doc contains the class folder, which is where you'll find um, under, under number four uh, callbacks. This is where you'll find the, um, the uh, Colab notebook, or you can just go to the Git repo itself and download it. So if you're joining late, welcome. Um, so back to where we were here, right? So we've trained our model and we can see that it's shrinking, 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 shrinking as it goes here, the learning rate is. Um, maybe it helped, maybe it didn't. This was not a, exactly a, a great thing here. This is uh, an example of like a linear decay for your learning rate here. Uh, very often you'll still see people that'll do like a natural log decay. You'll see people that do things like warm up steps, right? You know, like there's all kinds of techniques for those here. So uh, teaching you all those is outside the scope of this course because there's just too many to keep track of and they're all very specific to different problems. However, um, if you wanna create your own, here's how you do it. Now in practice, I usually don't create my own. I usually use what exists um, in the, uh, you know, kind of in the real world here, where I, I don't typically care about a schedule. I don't typically care about reducing the learning rate by this much in epoch one and this much in epoch two and so on and so forth. Instead, I care about it where I think of it almost like a control flow, like an, like an if else statement. I think of it as well, when do I want to reduce the learning rate? Well, I want to reduce the learning rate uh, whenever my model is kind of plateaued, once I see it's stuck and it's not getting better, then I want to reduce the learning rate here. And so what we're doing here is we see, uh, we see this when we're creating this here. So I'm monitoring the validation loss. Now, again, you could monitor validation accuracy too. Again, loss is generally a better, considered a better metric for this reason here. Um, factor is how much I'm going to shrink it by, right? So this is going to be a multiplicative factor uh, to shrink it. Um, so we're going to shrink it by a factor of 0.1 and then patience is how many epochs should I see the plateau happen, but or how many epochs where I see no improvement should, before I consider it a plateau, then it updates the learning rate. So typically I'm not always going to set a patience of two. I might set a higher one, something like that, five or 10, depends on the problem, depends on the, the size of the data, a lot of things. Um, and then factor something you might play around with too. I might set a higher factor, more aggressive, right? I want it to, to shrink by, this is shrinking by 10%. I want it to shrink by 90% or something like that. So that's up to you. These are things that, again, what you should put here, we won't get into because that's, uh, it's, it's too hard to generalize a statement about that. However, if you want to use it, I typically just use this, you know, with this is, 
I like the factor or the patience, things like that. I'm just pulling this straight from the Kara stocks here. So let's see what they set as the defaults. So the defaults, they set a factor of two, a patience of five, and they do set a minimum learning rate. They say, don't let it go past 0 0.001 uh, for that reason. Now, that's what they're starting with, that it probably is a good place for us to consider. I would have a good reason to use something different um, before I would. However, um, you know, there are times where that will come up. So just be aware of what, you, what it's doing and when you might want to do something different. So as we call this, let's look at how our learning rate changes here. And again, notice I haven't created a new model with each of these. So you're gonna see this getting higher and higher. This is the same model I've, hit, I've trained on. So if you run model.fit with 10 epochs twice, that's the same as running model.fit with 20 epochs. Um, unless you're overwriting the model, deleting the model, creating a new model, something like that. So do be aware of that. And we're starting to plateau. That's what we're looking for here. And we can see the learning rate has changed a good bit here, right? So again, this is a negative exponent, so it's getting smaller. As these numbers go up on the far right here, that means that it's getting smaller. So we are moving, right? So it's basically moving by one decimal. Um, so these are, so let's talk about what we've seen so far. We've talked about what a callback is. We've talked about uh, what, um, how we can save our models. We've talked about uh, what a learning rate is and when we would want to change it and why we would want to change it. Now, let's have some fun with TensorBoard. TensorBoard is super cool. And if you guys have never seen this, you're gonna love this, okay? Uh, so, so far, if you've been with us for our previous trainings, or you've watched our videos, you've noticed that it's very important for us to visualize the, the training epoch by epoch for our model because it's much easier to detect overfitting, right? That's when we can start to see that the model's accuracy has diverged uh, from the validation accuracy or the loss has uh, diverged from the validation loss. And we can go, aha, it is memorizing things. It is not, um, it is not generalizing and learning anymore. Um, so, this is just one of the things you'll want to do uh, to inspect your model and say, what is it learning? How is it learning? How did it change? Um, the challenge here is we're just making in the past some chintzy little matplotlib graphs, which were not very helpful. So uh, Google being what they are, you know, probably the one of the most, you know, probably arguably I think the biggest AI leader in the world right now, they have a awesome tool called TensorBoard, which actually spins up a web server. It takes logs for you of everything you could ever care about uh, during the training of the model, uh, epoch by epoch. Uh, and then it actually spins up a web server and visualizes that for you. So um, in order to use it, I just need to tell it where to store the logs, right? What my log directory is going to be. So I'm going to create a directory called logs. You don't have to do that. You can put that wherever. It's all the same. Uh, I'm going to tell it where that lives, right? Here's the logs folder. And I'm going to tell it, go ahead and write the graph uh, so I can actually see a visual representation of how the data is flowing through my model. So I can actually, if somebody said, uh, hey, draw me your neural network, it'll do that for me. Um, and uh, so for this here, I'm creating a new model because I want to start with new logs here. And I just pass in the TensorBoard callback I created. So I'll run one, two, three. And it's not going to be any different for, uh, for training here. Oops, let me get this one here. Uh, but as this finishes, I'm going to load up an extension. So there's an extension if you, uh, it, that comes, uh, you know, kind of with Jupyter Notebooks. It's the TensorBoard extension. So if you have Jupyter and TensorBoard, you can just pip install TensorBoard. If you're using um, Conda to install TensorFlow, I believe it installs it for you, but you can always just pip install it. And as long as you have uh, Jupyter and TensorBoard installed um, on your machine, you're fine, right? And all you have to do is this. You have to load the TensorBoard extension because it does not naturally load that Jupyter extension for us. And this will allow us to run the TensorBoard magic command right here in the notebook and spin this up. Now, you can always run TensorBoard from, um, uh, and here we are launching TensorBoard. You can always run this from the command line. Right, and it'll spin up a web server the same way that when you run Jupyter Notebook in the command line, it spins up a web server 
opens a tab in Chrome with it for you. This will open the same way. However, I find it's most useful to me to just embed it right there. Okay. You can also load TensorBoard and run TensorBoard and then start training your model. This is going to live update every, I'd say, 30 or so seconds, right? Um, so you can actually run this and then just refresh or watch this change as the model goes. Uh, so if you got some time on your hands and you want to do that, which I think is pretty cool, uh, and we can look at all these different things here, right? So um, I can look at it where I'm saying, hey, show me what this looks like here. I see orange is my training for validation, uh, excuse me, training for uh, accuracy by epoch and loss by epoch, and blue is my validation, right? And I can kind of see what's happening here. My training starts out lower than my validation in terms of accuracy, and that makes sense because I'm using dropout uh, to fight uh, overfitting. So, you know, dropout, as we learned in the last class, dropout uh, happens during training. It'll kill some neurons randomly, but not during testing. So and then it gets better and better and better. Uh, and as I look at this, the first thing that stands out to me as I go, this model isn't done training, right? I could, I could train for longer here. And um, you might be wondering what some of these things are here. Like what is a smoothing factor? And that's just literally to make the graph look better. Uh, see how it's kind of peaky and all over the place here. And you can just have the smoothing factor to go, okay, well, what's it look like, you know, really? And you still see the actual values down there. Um, so to give you a more general feel, this is pretty cool graphs. Uh, and it's going to take a little second here, but it is going to actually draw up a full neural network diagram of our model, which if you're going to publish a paper or you need to pass this off to a, maybe a team in a different place here, uh, this is very, very handy. This is really cool here. Um, so it takes a little while, uh, but we can actually zoom in and see this here. And you'll notice we have different uh, models for, um, whoops, let me zoom in. Whoops, there we are. Put that there. Touchpad on my uh, laptop could be better here. <laughs> but uh, essentially, uh, we can see, like, this is what it looks like here, right? So we have, uh, if we start reading here, we can see the arrows, right? And we can even see the arrows show the shape of the vectors. This is, uh, you might have seen us run um, model.summary then, uh, and it would tell us like, oh, well, here's how many trainable parameters this has, and here's what this is, and here's the shape of the output of each here. It actually shows you that here, right? Um, so uh, this is really cool, I think. I think it's incredibly useful. Um, you know, there's batch normalization. It's showing all the steps that happen in there. I think it does a moving average model to, to change that for you. Um, if you don't understand what some of these things mean, don't worry about it. Uh, it's something that you'll pick up with time and experience here. Uh, but it, essentially, um, this is, as you start to learn these things, this is very, very helpful uh, to understand what's happening. Now, these are just the two things I told it to write for this demo. When we look at inactive, here are all the other things that it can do for us here, right? So if you're working with images, which we are, but I didn't bother including that in the tensor board here, or audio, let's say you wanna see a histogram of your weights, right? So the, the weights start randomly, uh, but generally bounded, right? Within a, a certain range here, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna be between like a negative million and a million, they're gonna start generally pretty similar. Um, then you can say, well, wait, as this training goes, how are my weights shifting? Are some neurons more important than others? If you're working with text, or I think embeddings are probably my favorite here. Um, so if I do an embedding model, like a, you might be familiar with WordVec or BERT, you might have seen the classic graph of like king plus or minus man plus woman equals queen and where these things are in a vector space uh, and kind of ge uh, geometrically related to each, uh, each other here. It'll visualize that for you, which is super cool. Uh, there's even a what if tool to say that for you to do some experiments go, what if this was different? And, you know, what if this image was black and white instead of color? How would things change? So a lot of cool stuff you can do with this here. Uh, TensorBoard is going to save you a lot of good time uh, for debugging this stuff. 
And you'll find as you really get into this, especially when you get into your first job where you're using neural networks on the job here, you're gonna find studying this from a research perspective, it, it, like what is my model doing? Do I understand why my results are coming out here are at least as valuable as, spend, as spending time coding and doing things like that. So big fan of TensorBoard. I highly encourage you to look at it. We saw it's dead simple to use. All we have to do is know where we're gonna put our logs, tell the callback when we create it, pass it in, load the extension, and then use the com magic command to run it. And we just specify, this, this looks like a, a bash command here, just dash dash log deer, and then I point it towards the logs folder, okay? So that's TensorBoard. Now, uh, I, oh, I do see one question here. Uh, somebody asked, it shows that the accuracy on validation is higher uh, than on training, why? Uh, excellent question here. This is a, a pretty common thing at the beginning of training when you're using Dropout. Uh, so it's because I'm using Dropout uh, that is punishing the network by uh, essentially uh, randomly killing off some neurons, like 50-50, uh, because I'm using a 50% dropout rate, uh, whether or not any given neuron passes its info on or passes on zero. It essentially dies, and that, that helps fight overfitting. So uh, eventually training will pass. Training will pass validation. But in validation, um, that's done with inference. That's not done with the training model. So they build a separate version of the model that does not have dropout, where all the neurons get to play. So um, this trains all the, the various subnets, right? The, uh, if every different connection I could have of neurons here, if I drop out one neuron, that's a different subnet than I drop out a sec another neuron or two neurons and things like that. Um, so dropout's good for that, um, but it generally means that your validation is gonna do better in the beginning than your training, whereas, because um, you know your training is losing neurons, whereas your uh, your validation is not. And we, when you see this pass and you see them cross, that's typically a sign that you're where you need to be, that your model's not going to get better. Now, you might see them both kind of move up and to the right with the accuracy, hopefully uh, uh, down and to the right with loss um, for a time. So it's possible they'll both move at the same pace. It's when they start to diverge, we go, aha, my model is overfitting. So great question. Okay. So we are moving fast today. Uh, let's look at the next thing we're gonna do, which is a custom callback, okay? So we've seen how we can use some of the pre-built callbacks. And by the way, if you didn't notice when I was here, um, for callbacks themselves, these are all the basic callbacks that um, come with TensorFlow, right? That are built into Keras that you can use. So when we were visualizing um, the training, you know, you would matplotlib, like that was a history callback. We were just capturing it. That is built in, TensorFlow naturally returns uh, that callback for us um, at, uh, you know, at the end of everything, right? Where it's got all that logged. Maybe you wanna write your stuff to a CSV file, right? There's a CSV logger. Maybe you wanna uh, remotely monitor this here and send some stuff like, Maybe you're training on a server and you want to monitor it on a different server and do some stuff because of it. You can do that, right? Progress bar that we see that we're all, uh, that we all love to see because that means that our code isn't broken and it, the model at least trains. Uh, the progress bar logger here, um, the first time it reaches a, uh, not a number, which is be when your model's hitting integer overflow or underflow in terms of error. This can happen when you have a vanishing or exploding gradient problem, which we won't go into. Uh, that's a way to just say, cut it, don't keep training. Um, and then just generally the base logger class that some of these things are built on. Uh, lambdas are even cooler. They're layers you can add. They basically do uh, almost like a lambda function in Python. I mean, it's exactly that. You can add some programmatic behavior. So for instance, if you know that, um, if you know that your model, if you're doing a regression and you know that the model is generally going to be, the output should always be in like a hundred, like, you know, it's, it's not, the answer isn't ever going to be one or two. It's going to be one or two hundred one little trick you can do is to take the output of the model and then multiply it by a hundred uh, using like a Lambda layer or a Lambda callback uh, and your model will converge faster uh, because it's gonna start by outputting things around one or two. And if you just multiply it, you're good. It's much less weight updates that need to happen uh, than if you were to like um, let it naturally all the way to just to scale up to that size here. Um, so 
these are the callbacks that are built in, but what if none of those work for us? What if we need something else? Uh, we can create a custom callback really easily, okay? So um, all we have to do to build a custom callback is to subclass the callback object itself, okay? So we can get that by just saying tf.caris.callbacks.callback, right? And that is our super class. Um, so this part, typically I know a lot of data scientists are pretty good with functions, things like that. Uh, if you're not familiar with object-oriented programming, this might look a bit weird for you, okay? Um, but anytime you see class, this is an OOP thing going on here, object-oriented programming. So we are creating a class that is a child of this class, which means uh, it inherits all the same traits. Now, in order for it to play nicely, it's inheriting these, these methods, right? And what are these methods? Well, we can view them over here, okay? Um, or what, not that one. We can see them, let's see, tf.callback. Um, callback, here we are. This should do it. So here's the documentation for the callback class we are subclassing. Right, and it talks about the different attributes here. Now you see these methods. These are the methods that the callback class can use at any given point, okay? Um, so this is uh, any class that subclasses callback is gonna have these two. Now, we might want it to do something different. Right now, like on predict begin or on predict end, it's not doing anything, right? Like we look at it, it's just none, nothing happens, right? But Maybe we want to do something when a prediction's happened, or maybe, uh, you know, to me, on train end is one of the more useful ones here. When the model's completely done training, that's different than on epoch end. Um, then I might want to do something, right? So right now I have these empty methods that aren't doing a thing here, but I can always subclass the class, the callback class, and in my subclass, my version of on train end does, does something. I can add in whatever code I want. So, um, as I kind of run through this here, um, this one is just, uh, this is a, some code that I borrowed from the TensorFlow uh, documentation uh, and just updated a bit here where its only goal here uh, is on certain, uh, on, on epochs to print out something. And this is just a demonstration of what happens on, on epoch end, you see the epoch ends and then it prints some stuff, right? And if you do it on, on epoch begin, it'll print it before all this, right? So this is just showing the basic code you need um, for all this here. Um, so pretty simple. We just create our own, we instantiate it. And again, I, I'm instantiating it inside the callback, uh, inside the list is getting passed to callbacks. I can also do that outside, bind it in a variable, pass the variable in like we've done before. All the same, totally fine. Okay, so um, this brings us to our uh, a, a fun part we're adding in, which is, uh, as I've said here, like, you know, sometimes I'll train a model and I know this could take anywhere between, you know, 20 minutes and 20 hours, uh, worst case scenario. I don't want to sit in front of my computer all day and, uh, you know, wait for it. I also don't want it to finish at two and I come back and, you know, I don't come back till 10 PM and go, Oh, wait, I, I wasted a bunch of time. I could have kept working. Uh, I want to know when it's done and better yet. I want to know how's it doing. Is it overfitting? Should I stop it? Um, to get some basic metrics. So it's very common to see uh, data scientists, and machine learning engineers build their own custom callback and use a service like Slack or Twilio to notify them. So um, I went with uh, Twilio just so I can send myself a text message. Um, but uh, you have to follow the Twilio uh, tutorial. There's a lot of great sample code online for this year. Twilio helps you. Uh, I've actually linked to a GitHub repo that I pulled uh, a lot of this sample code from before I tweaked it. Um, and it's, it's actually pretty simple. Here, let's actually look at it here. So um, I'm gonna go, uh, this is <laughs> one star. Let's give him a star, he was great. Uh, this was nice to, uh, nice of him to write this. So <laughs> um, essentially, uh, this was an example of a callback code that he wrote for us here. Uh, and he put it on GitHub. I'm sure he's using it. And uh, it's great for us to use too. 
Um, so we can just look through this code. We see, okay, he wrote, wrote a subclass. Subclass is that. Great documentation. This guy looks like a good coder. I would hire him. Um, calls the init on the super method. If you don't understand object-oriented programming, that might not make sense to you. That's totally okay. Um, this is some stuff that you'll need to do. You'll need to set your, um, uh, this is like the, your account ID number and your authorization token you'll get from signing up for Twilio. Uh, you can get this for free to test it. Uh, I did just before this. Um, they give you like 15 bucks in free, you know, phone calls or text messages that you can trigger programmatically in any language you want. Um, Python or Java or whatever. Um, and then we see, ah, on epoch n, this looks familiar. And this is because he's overloading this method, right? So um, this in the basic callback class is empty, but he's actually said, well, if um, he's gonna do a modulo operation, and so you, maybe I say, uh, for instance, when I run it, I say, hey, every two epochs or every five epochs, um, send me a log here. And this is just a way to count that, right? And um, then he's basically putting together the message. We get this from that. And then using the Twilio client, to send that message and that's all it takes. Not too bad at all. So uh, Twilio does not come pre-installed. Um, uh, so, and, and again, we're, we're running a series on uh, TensorFlow machine learning engineering, not Twilio. So uh, unfortunately we're not gonna walk through how to do all this. However, um, it's very, very easy. I did it with you know no problems, no Googling, no nothing. Just going through their basic tutorial and using that Keras code uh, that I've linked there in the, uh, in the notebook uh, so I'm sure you can figure this out quite quickly, okay? Um, your version should have these X'd out <laughs> if you do see a token there. Uh, that means I forgot to delete it. I double checked. I'm pretty sure I deleted it. Uh, but if you see something, please don't use it. Get your own. Uh, I don't have a credit card attached to it, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, you will need to do that. and You can try and test it out your own. So uh, always use your own token and uh, notice how he's setting an environment variable. So that way you, you typically don't want to write these things down in code. Certainly, and I'm going to repeat this, do not put this in like a Jupyter notebook and then push that Jupyter notebook to GitHub. Do not hard code these, right? Because if you push them, then you're basically giving away the password and anybody can use your service. Um, this is something that a lot of people learn the hard way when they accidentally push code that has their auth token for like AWS and hackers scan GitHub and steal these codes and then, you know, charge $1,500 or $2,000 worth of runtime, like mine Bitcoin and steal from you here. So like never, never, never take sensitive materials and publish it to GitHub. So that's why I've X'd it out. Um, I've just kind of borrowed and tweaked some of the code that we saw here from uh, A. Tremblay. Um, written that here. And uh, I just need to run that. Uh, now notice I ran this before with the things actually in there. So I can uh, hopefully demo this for you now. Those environment variables should be set. Oh, whoops, we need to pip install Twilio because this is a new runtime. So I'm gonna run that. Easy enough. Now I'm gonna go down here and run this. And my class has been created. And then here I have my phone number, please don't call me, and the phone number that Twilio generated for me. And I want it every five epochs, right? So if I run this, I should get a text message. Um, name Twilio is not defined. Let me try that one more time here. One more time. Oh, I would need to, oh, Twilio, what did I call it? Twilio callback. That would be why. There's my bug. Okay, models training. So uh, I should get a text message um, at uh, five epochs here. And I've turned my sound up here, I've turned my ringer off, which feels weird, or turn my ringer on. <laughs> um, so let's see if I get a text message comes through here. And I did, okay, so this code works. And I should get one more text message after the 10th epoch finishes.
And we're done. And there's our text message. And I can see the Epoch 9. My loss was uh, 0 0.2230. Yeah, or it should be up oh, because I'm offset. It starts counting at zero instead of that, uh, instead of one. Um, my accuracy validation, loss validation accuracy. Very, very cool. Okay, so you have now seen everything that you need to see in order to write your own Twilio callback. And you can do the same thing here, right? Now, you, uh, if you built a, a class for, you know, you figure out the basic functionality. Uh, so for instance, if you wanted to do this over Slack or you wanted to send an email or maybe you wanted to store uh, the logs in a, um, you know, you, it doesn't just have to be the, the model that you, you know, you've got the logs, you got all that stuff here. Um, maybe you want to grab the folder and send it up somewhere or do that or store it offline. All these things are things you can do. The world is your oyster, right? So you just got to think about it and do it. And if you can code it, you can then put it in this subclass and then you've got a custom callback, which can do all this cool stuff. So, um, that's all we're going to cover for today. We do have some time for questions, plenty of time. We finished a bit earlier today. Um, so feel free to fire them off. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them here. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to pile in, let's review what we learned today, okay? Um, so how are you a better machine learning engineer now than when you started this video, you know, an hour and 15 minutes ago? Well, you now understand what a TensorFlow callback is, if you weren't familiar with them before. Uh, you know how to save your models, and more importantly, how to save only the models that are best. You understand how to stop training early, and uh, generally why you would use a cutting edge technique like early stopping. Uh, to save yourself time and money and to make sure your model doesn't go from good to great to horrible uh, because you let it train too long uh, and it starts overfitting. We learned about a learning rate and we learned how we can uh, uh, tweak that hyperparameter by scheduling changes in our learning rate uh, by writing our own functions. We also learned maybe we just want to adjust our learning rate and shrink it when the model plateaus. So, uh, we learned how to use the learning rate reduce on plateau callback. We got some fun times examining our model statistics and our model architecture and all that good stuff in TensorBoard. And finally, we wrote two custom callbacks, one that was a simple one and one that was uh, meant to uh, send a Twilio message, so a text message through Twilio to tell us our statistics and tell us when training is done. Very, very cool stuff. Again, this is all based on uh, the callbacks uh, class here, which is kind of the eye of this hurricane here, which can be found in tensorflow.keras.callbacks, right? And these were our methods, so you can modify any of these, and these will be called at the appropriate times in training, uh, as you can tell by the, the name of it all, okay? So um, that's all we got for today. Thank you all so much for attending. We really appreciate it here. Um, we'll stick around for a couple more minutes. If any of you guys have questions you want to fire off, um, about what we cover today or about deep learning in general. Um, and, uh, if we don't, then we'll sign off. So I'll give it a couple minutes. Uh, had a question uh, here. Somebody says, what parameters are passed to the callback function? That is an excellent question. Uh, and I believe it's just any parameters in the model here you do have access to, right? Um, so this is going to be the training parameters that are set when the model is passed in, right? So number of epochs, batch size, if we set it to be verbose to zero or one, what our training data is. You might set a step size, right? You might do a bunch of things like that. So whatever you set, anything you've set, and when you call model.fit, you will have access to those values as a dictionary, okay? Uh, and uh, if there's specific things you're looking for, um, it'll talk about that in the documentation. So this is very, very good documentation here that'll kind of explain 
what you have access to at any given time. Uh, you'll see that some of them here um, that uh, take in logs, right? So this is going to be, um, you know, on, at the first epoch, nothing, right? There are no logs yet because nothing's run. However, you'll have like the logs dictionary for, you know, for an epoch five, you'll have things for um, logs for like what the history was for at the end of epoch one, two, three, and four. Uh, and you can access those things here. And you'll actually see in our code here that we borrowed, um, this guy passes in the entire logs here. This is, a, this is a keyword arguments framework here, which basically says you can pass in this, um, you know, asterisk, asterisk, and then that uh, and uh, as a dictionary, and it'll set those as kind of environment variables, right? So you have something where you can see we actually access them up here, right? So um, there was something called val ack, and uh, by the way, don't just try and use this code directly and it will work. Uh, 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 and it won't work if you do this here on TensorFlow 2 because in TensorFlow 1, it was ACK and VALACK. Uh, now it's accuracy and VAL accuracy, which I think is uh, much more clear. Um, so you will need to update the code for that. But notice how it's literally just, you know, this is just using string formatting and they're just grabbing this va variable, which was stored in a dictionary called logs under the key VALACK. Okay. Uh, so you do have access to all those things here. You do have things like learning rates and all these other things that you can need to know about the model it is here. And I would encourage you if there's specific things you're looking for here, take a look at the documentation for the callback here. There are a bunch of good stuff here. If you can't find it, uh, don't be afraid uh, to Google it or better yet, go to the source on GitHub and comment and, and ask and you will get an answer very, very quickly. The TensorFlow team is really great about that. Um, Question here. Second question. Uh, can you please give us the previous session recordings uploaded links? Yes, you can find that on the Elephant Scale website, and you'll see that um, you'll see that uh, in the tinyurl.com link here that we had at the top of the document. So if we are, let's see, where are we? If you go to here, you can find them. Uh, I believe they're set there here. Um, somebody asked, was TensorBoard installed through PIP? I missed that. Um, so I, uh, Colab is going to have TensorBoard installed natively, so I did not need to pip install it. Um, if you install TensorFlow on your machine locally and you're using Conda, I believe Conda installs TensorBoard along with it too. You won't need to worry about that. Um, if you're starting from like a greenfield, totally empty virtual environment, and you're going to install things manually, uh, then yes, you can pip install TensorBoard. Um, you just pip install TensorBoard, pip install Jupyter, and then you'll have access to TensorBoard, which you can run as a command line interface. I can go to a bash terminal and I can just say, like a shell, and I can just type in TensorBoard dash dash log here and it sets logs. Uh, I can, uh, for instance, um, I can take um, that and just run it as a magic command as we saw. And as long as you uh, load the extension for TensorBoard, you can use the magic command there. So good question. Uh, looks like a third question here. Uh, in the model.fit step, I had to add a command to store the model uh, to a model variable and set the epochs variable before I could run it. Is that what you had to do? Uh, so yes, you do have to tell it how many epochs here. And if you'll notice, I did that um, up here in the model itself. And um, that, and we may need to pop that out. Oh yeah. Uh, so I put it in here, but once I put it in the function, it didn't actually help you guys because uh, that becomes a scope thing here. So we can do this. If you if you don't want to if you want to set epochs to you know all uppercase epochs and set it somewhere, um, then uh, essentially you, you need to do that outside of it here. Otherwise, just set it in the fit step, right? Um, so you'll see I, I put it and set it here uh, on a lot of this here. Um, so yeah, you can always just pass in a value. Uh, I like to follow the best practice of setting my hyperparameters in a different cell. And then you know passing those all in because it allows you to iterate very quickly. But for a demo like this, totally normal to pass that in. And uh, I don't think anybody's going to blow you up on a code review uh, if you set your epochs manually in a fit call, anyways. There. But the answer is yes. I do have to do that same thing there. Good question. Looks like another question here. Does TensorBoard let you set the same kind of triggers you were doing programmatically, e.g., to prompt one to look at the charts generated after X epochs or at the end of training? Uh, kind of. 
So uh, what you can do here is, uh, so again, like we're writing the logs, right? And the logs are the logs, they're, they're written down. So whether I see them immediately after the 30 puck is finished, or I see them when everything's done, and I go and I say, what was the accuracy at epoch three? I'm gonna get the same thing, right? So it's all written down somewhere, I can review it whenever. Um, and you just saw, you might've just saw it spinny there and refresh, that's because it checks every 30 seconds to update. There have been no changes here. Um, so one thing you can do if you want to look at TensorBoard as you're training is to load the extension, load TensorBoard, and then uh, train all this stuff here, right? And then train your model that uses a TensorBoard callback because the model is gonna be writing to those logs. And as those logs get written, they're just sitting there in the log folder. You have an entirely separate process, which is TensorBoard, that is every 30 seconds checking that log folder for any updates and updating the graph and visualizing it. So you can run TensorBoard live. That absolutely is something I do all the time. It is a best practice uh, if you're training live here. I just think TensorBoard is easier to look at and I like to look at a graph more than I like to look at um, just this plain text here uh, of the progress bar we see with Keras. So totally something you can do. Just load the TensorBoard extension, run TensorBoard, um, either for, if you're gonna run it in the notebook, load the extension and then run TensorBoard or run it separately from a command line interface um, and then turn around and start your training and you will have all that good stuff here. Uh, so any triggers are still gonna be on the model. They're not really something in TensorBoard. TensorBoard's only job is to read the logs. The model is going to do some things with logs here. Now, you might write separate logs to a CSV file or something like that. There, you'll see there was a CSV logger class. Uh, and if you want to get into more complex stuff, you can do that. Um, the TensorBoard itself, you could, uh, you could study and you could do a 10 hour course on. There's just so much to it here. So uh, we didn't go too deeply into that because it's pretty subject specific to what anybody needs. Uh, however, there are great tutorials all over YouTube about this here. Uh, and if there's something specific you're trying to do, feel free to shoot us an email. We're always happy to chat and answer your questions, okay? Uh, great questions. Okay, looks like that's all the questions we've seen here. We might have finished about a half hour early. Uh, I'll, I'll wait for, let's give it 60 more seconds. If anybody else has a question they're typing now, go ahead and let me know and uh, I'll wait around to answer it. Otherwise, uh, thank you all so much for coming. This was, uh, this was fun and hopefully we'll see you next week, okay? Ram, you are very welcome. Thank you for attending. Basileos, thank you too. You're very welcome, Abdul. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, Al Mercado is asking, when loading your own data set for TensorFlow, you would still start with pandas as usual. Is that right? Short answer, Al, is yes. Um, so in TensorFlow 2, um, you can always load your model using pandas. Pandas a NumPy array under the hood, right? So I can absolutely at any point just uh, do the classic like um, split my data into training and testing sets by myself. Uh, we've been making use of TensorFlow data sets for, uh, for this learning series here. Obviously that works for some, not others, uh, not always. Sometimes you, you have a data pipeline, you wanna leave it how it is here, you don't need to do all this. Uh, I would recommend using this when possible, um, but you can still always do it the other way. And since a data frame is a NumPy array, it'll work just seamlessly with that. Uh, the middle ground here is if you wanted to take your data sets and turn it into a TensorFlow data set object. So there's a TF data set object itself here. That, um, then uh, it has methods that can allow you to pass that in. So you, it, it takes in a NumPy array um, and you can pass in either the entire thing, right? So it's like, uh, you can just do like data set top from tensor, or maybe you're taking a piece of it, right? You want the data set to be everything except the column that has the labels. And that would be from tensor slices, okay? So uh, that is something that is um, uh, quite easy to do here. So um, there's, uh, you'll see some sample code um, that you'll find on the TensorFlow website. Uh, the documentation on that is excellent and that can walk you through that, okay? But yeah, absolutely, you can do that with pandas and numpy. Great question. Here's a familiar name, Sabasas. Uh, 
Uh, thanks. The links kind of remain available through email. Yes, they will. We will be emailing them out here. Uh, again, as always, Zoom is going to take a certain amount of time to pre-process this. As soon as we get it out, uh, we'll update it and uh, we'll, we'll put it uh, out there where it's accessible for you guys with all the other videos, uh, all the other content, uh, and, and you'll be able to access it that way. We generally try and send out emails when that happens, so you'll be aware, okay? Uh, so awesome. Yeah, look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks for coming to so many of them. I'll give it one more minute if there's any lingering questions people have. Uh, here's a good question. What is the next session? Uh, next session will be uh, this following uh, Thursday. So we like to do these uh, every week at this day and time. Okay. So uh, in, 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 until further notice here, you know, and barring any changes, we'll certainly make you aware of. I don't see why there would be. You can typically set your watch by uh, Elephant Scale is going to have a great machine learning engineering learning series class Thursdays uh, from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific time. Right, I'm guessing that's all of it. Well, everybody, thank you so much for attending. If you have any further questions or uh, you go back and you, you run into something you forgot to ask, you can always shoot us an email. We'll be happy to get right back to you, okay? So thank you all so much and uh, have a great day. Hopefully we see you next week. Same time, same place.